Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our conference. I hope you've had a nice little break and have grabbed yourself a cup of tea and perhaps a little biscuit if you feel that's appropriate. Um, we're going to move straight on to our next speaker, uh, who is Graham Campbell, who is going to speak on uh, reparative justice and the street scene of Scotland's slavery legacy. Graham is a musician, poet, and cultural producer of 30 years standing. He's previously worked as a cultural producer during the Commonwealth Games 2014 and established Glasgow's first African, uh, African Caribbean Centre in 2009. After 25 years of activism in housing campaigning, Graham was elected as SNP councillor for Springburn Rebroyston Ward and became Glasgow's first African Caribbean councillor in May 2017. Very welcome, Graham. Over to you. Or not. There we go. <laughs> we need to unmute you, Graham. Sorry. And thank you. Susan, thank you for that. And first of all, let me say uh, how incredibly impressed I was by the two previous uh, co contributions. And, you know, I, I know Lisa very well, so I knew what I was going to get. But again, once again, I've learned even more uh, than I did before, but particularly welcome Davy's contributions. I felt that very, very personally. Uh, it very much chimed in with the story of Rastafarians and how their uh, heritage has been wiped over within the Jamaican society and it, it, there's lots of resonances there for me um, the, and he didn't use that word but it certainly ev evoked a, a sense that Scotland is partly responsible for a, a genocide against the, the people he's, he's described so uh, I want to put that on record that is something I will pay a lot more attention to from here on. Um, speaking of uh, Genocides. I suppose I should start by really sharing my screen and sharing my my, my visual images. If we go, go on. I will try during the course of this uh, um, presentation to sort of be a bit more sort of um, specific to Glasgow. So apologies for that. That it's going to be a bit more specific to, to Glasgow, but I, I'll try and be as well um, talking about the whole thing. Um, but bear with me. I'm going to just quickly share my screen. Um, there we are. Is that working? Wonderful, thank you. All right, so I'm going to start by saying this um, about my my other hat that I'm wearing. Um, I'm the chairperson of Flag Up Scotland Jamaica, which is a twinning body that was set up in 2014 at the time of the Commonwealth Games to inform, educate about the significant cultural links and heritage between the peoples of Scotland and Jamaica, and to initiate creative links and twinning for education, partnership and prosperity. Uh, we were formed actually in the Chamber of Commerce in 2014 at the time of the Commonwealth Games with the Jamaican team represented, with the Jamaican High Commissioner, with representatives from the Scottish Government, and from the UK government uh, present, as well as the city council. We were hosted by the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce in the Merchant's House. And that's significant because that body began life as the Glasgow West India Merchants Association. So it's quite fitting that such an organization like ours, which is a reparative justice project, was founded right there in the offices of the ancestors of the slave owners, if you like. So it was quite important for me that to, to make and acknowledge that connection that we were connected to Glasgow's story at the time when it was, you know, basically telling, showing the world what it was, and what its story was. And what I'm going to sort of say is really about how heritage and what it means is uh, about the story we choose to tell ourselves and the stage sets we choose to tell it from. So my plan today is to convince you that if towns, cities, and nations acknowledge their slavery in rich heritage and make reparation, they will foster a more diverse and inclusive future for these islands. I'll leave that thought there with you for a second or two. Now, if I quickly get back to the next bit, I'm going to basically play uh, a video. Um, some of you will be familiar with the Doors Open Day uh, event that we host in, in, in across the, in the world actually, but in Glasgow we, we have a particularly good one. Um, so I did this for 2019's uh, event and basically I was inspired by the surroundings of the, of the trade house, trade hall and the, what was around the walls. If you know the mahogany walls, there are donations listed there from very wealthy merchants from 
right from the 1700s onwards. And I, I wanted to basically respond to that in artistic form. So this is what I did. It'll be about five minutes or so. Let's hope it works from the link. Button down those hatches. Doors open wide, say, ah, 30 years on display. Keep those captive, inconvenient truths firmly below decks, lest they spoil our mercantile narrative 400 years in the making. Let the organized forgetting begin. Let us come inside to inspect our iron traders, carpet bag makers of Africans in irons, heritage. Here it is. Coming up on nigh on 500 locations in preparation for your viewing pleasure. Marvel at the merchant house's walls and feel their stories. See their glorious profiles, their very stories dripping down red through the centuries. As the marble squeaks, the wood panel creaks, and the carpet reeks, a squelch that all in the hall can hear it start in the squall of an Atlantic storm's call. The journey, the journey, the journey is long. The journey, the journey, the journey is long. And no one, not even I myself, can walk with me when the journey is so, so long. Enslaved captive Africans squealed from the wealth, wrung out from their twisted bodies, martyred from onboard resistance. <coughs> yes, yes, button down those hatches, my seafaring merchant friend, for you, Nagwine, want your cargo for your skip. Insurance now go and cover that excess, my friend. Look menacingly west as you hear your fortune calling you whilst you dump your chained up oversized human excess catch east for the sharks. Doors open wide, entry is scot free. Roll up, roll up, cast adrift your humanity to make your big cash getaway. You can't work this angle of the free point parade, unwilling compass points of the triangular trade. Traders in shipping for the Clyde is wide, for business pun enslaved people back. 500 open door Glasgow buildings, each a stepping stone back 400 years, like castle forts on the Guinea Stamp coast. From this, where we're proud? Glassford, Buchanan, Ewing, Ingram, and Watt, their streets named Desire, and each Visca Bay sip is a Scots inoculation blended through the African Ocean to the Caribbean Sea. Yet all the brush and water cannot wipe the record of straining incredulity, arguments triple distilled, reputations intact, but the tainted glass windows still remain. Well, me see you. We follow your evidence trail to the merchant house, as you can see. Glasgow West India merchants handed their baton in the relay of business to William Cunningham Mansion, inherited stock exchange and plantation Negro owners. As you West India merchant men wine, women, and dine up to the nines in your opulent surroundings. Would you ever imagine that I man would cast a dread eye upon your works? The plaques said all on the wall. Ten thousand pounds towards build the all. 
Mr. Ewing at Glasgow and Jamaica, plantation restrainer, human dignity drainer. So, doors wide open, say, ah, tobacco lord, you ain't got no more title. Sugar princes, you know I'm going to come king. Cotton kings, consider yourself dethroned. We're taking away your heavyweight title. So, open wide, say, ah, I get it now. So, all who must come through this door, know it's organized remembering and respect Jew. But anyway, it's okay. So I, I wanted to have that first slide really to sort of explain uh, the, the way I thought that the heritage story could be told in a way that incorporates the, the difficult legacy. So we, we obviously have had, Lisa, so I can be fairly quick with this section. What are the links between Scotland, UK and the Caribbean slave trade? Obviously, the UK dominated this triangular trade. It's used its naval power to monopolize commodity trade routes. That's the kind we're talking about. Organized forgetting, Scotland's collective amnesia on particularly tobacco, sugar, and cotton in the west of Scotland, but also, as Lisa explained, other commodities which were important, such as linen and indigo. How the slave trade benefited Glasgow, merchant cities' architecture, its banking, its shipping, its textile trade, its shipbuilding trade, all have their origins, the money developed through capitalism and slavery in the drag in the trade. So what impact did it have? Clearly that industries were developed, farms and country estates were improved, private schools and charitable institutions, including hospitals, museums, were endowed with the, the, the profits from this. And Stephen Mullen's book, which is really seminal, which in my view is a good starting place I always point people to, but it's not nearly widely enough available, but it begins as a history of the architecture, uh, and looking at who owned the buildings, where they came from, and where some of these buildings still exist, where they used to be. Shawfield Mansion is a really important one, but it, it tells you about the geography of the city centre of Glasgow was designed by merchants who made their money this way, and basically they designed a set which celebrated them. You can't be surprised by that, that these, as I say, the great white people, white men of history, designed a city centre which reflected their values, their priorities, and indeed, even laid the layout of the streets, the fact that the city centre is where it is now, where George Square is, it used to be at Trongate, and it moved there because those that land around what's now Queen Street and George Square was, was marshland to the west of the city centre, which was then bought and developed, ended up with the buildings that we know about. And I'll go to the next slide, which tell you about some of these buildings, what I call the crime scene. And I call it that because these buildings are the exhibits in a long historic crime uh, against humanity. Let's be clear, we, we understand what crimes against humanity mean. We understand that because of the recent, relatively recent history of 70 years ago, where during a 12 year period, the Nazi regime literally eliminated, exterminated through a genocide, the Jewish population of, of, of Europe. And they did so with an ideology which also crushed democracy, crushed freedom of speech, and launched a world war which killed literally tens of millions of people all over the planet. Now, we know about that. We know, understand about humanity and inhumanity. But this crime went on for 250 years. And Britain was right at the heart of it. These are the proceeds, these are the exhibits that come from it. I'm here standing at uh, what we now call the Gelba, the Glasgow Gallery of Modern Art. It's actually William Cunningham's mansion. That's what it should be called. And anybody who's in my side of this discussion, usually that's what we call it. It's Cunningham's slave mansion. And it became, uh, you know, obviously it's been added to, but the original house is on the entrance is on the side there to the right behind me. And in front of me is now as Wellington statue and the Cone Man, and that's a, a site of heritage conflict, which we shall talk about in a minute when we discuss statues and the whole slavery debate. But I just wanted to make that point that this became 
the headquarters of the West Indian merchants. It was the headquarters of the first stock exchange. The man's house was so big that he could ha you know, house all the other rich people who laid out country houses and estates in the middle of what's now the middle of the city. These, this was you have to think of this as a millionaire's row of sugar billionaires, the equivalent of sort of Apple and iTech billionaires today, who were showing off of their mansions, and he had the biggest one. So naturally, he was the one who hosted it in the madhouse. So they formed that into the stock exchange. This royal exchange around it is where they did their business, their, their prices, their trades. They, they, they did their business from there. So this is a really important building, which is the headquarters, essentially, of the pro-slavery lobby. That's where they, they are from. That's, you know, it becomes the headquarters after they move from John Lake. I'm also standing here on a grave in 20... 14, we produced a play called the Emancipation Acts with Glasgow Life, myself and my partner Anne McLaughlin. We co-produced it with Jean uh, Cameron at Glasgow Life, a theatre production which was written by Alan McKendrick, and it was based on Stephen Mullen's book that I just showed you in the slide of. And this is us dancing and standing outside this same building, making the call for reparations. and using our actors and dancers and singers to do so. And we did that right during the Commonwealth Games. And the fact that we were able to do that meant that we were not afraid as a city. And that's some tribute to us. As well as my project, there was the Empire Cafe, there were books, there were talks, there was talks in the um, in the Glasgow Green area at the time, debate between Stephen, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mullen, and then to Tom, Professor Tom Devine debate about that slavery legacy. Did, Scotia, did slavery make Scotia great? We had that right during the games. And that was good for us to actually, you know, when we had a uh, Commonwealth coming to us where half the countries were from Africa and the Caribbean, it seemed wrong for us not to mark that heritage and to make a statement about it. And we used our projects to basically tell that story. And in the course of the play, we, we went from various different sites across the merchant city, as they call it now, and that's me standing on the grave of one of these former Lord Provosts in the Ramshorn graveyard. And we went round that graveyard to depict as one of our scenes the reality of slavery and Scotland's link to it in West Africa. The young man you see there just here is Shuti Gatwa, which if you watch Netflix, you may recognize him. He is one of the characters from the, the series Sex Education. So he's become quite a successful actor. Well, that was his first acting job. That's him acting as a, a caddy around this Rand Hong church where we reenacted uh, what it would have been like to visit Bance Island off the coast of Sierra Leone. It's the slave fort that was controlled by Scottish merchants, the Oswalds, for about 80 years in their family. They probably exported, and that's the polite word, they kidnapped and, and trafficked something like, you know, Depends which numbers you see, but I've seen numbers say at least 80,000 up to, you know, two or 300,000 Africans from that island alone during that period. Uh, and, you know, they went to the West Indies. They sh were the first place to have golf in Africa. And golf was first played in this, along this, around this island, and ships merchants would be visiting, ready to buy captive enslaved Africans while playing a round of golf. Uh, and we reenacted that around the Rams Hearn from Kirk. So we used the, the site of the glorification of these people because you know, to be buried in the Rams Hearn Kirk, you had to be quite a wealthy merchant. Several Lord Provosts of Glasgow were there and had a city councillor. That's a big thing that Lord Provosts are buried around there who were merchants in this trade. And when you use that word merchant, it's not a neutral term. If you were a merchant in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, early 1900s, you were involved in the slave trade. There's no question about that. All the, com all the commodities that Glasgow sold that had organized forgetting about what it did around slavery, tobacco and cotton and where it came from. The textile industry, where its cotton came from, almost entirely enslaved African produced. So these are things we've deliberately forgotten, but the exhibits are there in plain sight if we choose to see them. And that was part of making this crime scene visible. So what has Glasgow done about recognizing that, that, that uh, legacy? I make that point about reparation versus reparations. It, it's a really stupid argument. We always have about how much money should be involved and you know, what do we do to, 
to, to restitute. Really, it's about, we have a different way of looking at this. We say reparation deliberately. We, we say that it's about repairing the relationship. It's about re-remembering, not culturally forgetting. So we approached Glasgow University, you be aware that uh, a Caribbean study centre was set up with, you know, for a million pound a year for the next 20 years. We just literally last month opened that. It's the Beneva Centre for Caribbean uh, Slavery Legacy. Glasgow University has done that in partnership with the University of West Indies. There's been knock-on effect with the University of Edinburgh doing its stuff. The University of Cambridge at Jesus College has started to do similar work in you know, analysing its own uh, past. The question of de-racialising de and decolonising the curriculum, both at university and even at secondary and primary level, has become a massive international question, thanks to the, the, the initial start, the kickoff that Glasgow University has done from five years ago when we approached them about this. Um, it's resulted in this year, Glasgow University becoming the University of the Year as part of it, because of its reparative justice work. So this is some of the work we did from 28, 2018 and 19. The, we've been working with the Camp Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights to we'll have a museum of slavery, empire, colonialism and migration. Uh, Jackie Kay wrote a special poem on, on the dedication of uh, a stone made in the University Chapel, that's Glasgow University Chapel, at the launch of this initiative between the University of Glasgow and the University of the West Indies in the Caribbean. So what we did in the past was, well, buildings are very important. Obviously, new heritage as well as old heritage, but the fact that the most expensive building the university has ever built is the Student Learning Hub on University Avenue. It's going to be named after Dr. James McCune Smith, MD, the first uh, African-American to qualify as a, a, me a medical doctor here in Glasgow, celebrated as in, uh, named after the important, most important building. We have a plaque unveiled, and this is a, a regular thing we're beginning to see in Scotland. This is not the first building to do it, but we unveiled this plaque, recognising that the site on which the university's main campus is sited is in fact a former slave master's house, and Robert Bogle owned the land who sold Gilmore Hill uh, to uh, the university, his ancestors did that, and he benefited from enslaved Africans, and that plaque commemorates those enslaved Africans who suffered to create the wealth. But very few people realise that Kelvin Grove and Gilmore Hill are the names of the slave plantations' owners' houses on those lands, so the fact that we are recognising that is a very important start. So how does this all evolve? How, why should we do this? Scotland, by accepting its role as a perpetrator nation, and that's a difficult story because we're dealing with two mythical narratives. One of them is that Scotland is this plucky, we oppressed nation which suffered colonialism by England. The other mythical narrative is, oh, we, the British, are, are great because we abolished slavery. It forgets the bit of where we didn't abolish slavery. In fact, we were the main perpetrators of slavery for several hundred years, but that is forgotten. So these two mythical narratives affect us because it, it colours the way we look at the, the heritage infrastructure and the stories we're telling now. So clearly a proper uh, assessment of what that history is and what it entails is really important. Dr. Eric Williams, the Williams thesis, he was right. It was capitalism and slavery, that the primitive accumulation that occurred because of unfree labour in the Caribbean and, and North America created the ability for the Industrial Revolution and therefore the development of the Scottish economy as we've known it this last 200 years. Scotland acknowledges its dire, global diaspora is empire related. And that's the point, you know, I'm a Campbell. The reason why I'm a Campbell is because, as we say, we're the living exhibits, proof of this uh, slavery colonial link. There are people with my names in West Africa, in the Indian subcontinent, in Hong Kong, they are part of the Scottish global diaspora. Many of them don't know that because obviously that history has been deliberately forgotten and put over in a place. But I think if Scotland acknowledges that that's what its past role is, it can have a more equal relationship with the people who are there now. So how does this all foster a diverse inclusion? Racism has to be acknowledged that it comes from somewhere. The current attempt in cultural and heritage studies to sort of re 
glorify the global empire and you know talk about empire group 2.0 that culture war around statues in fact that you know the, you're damaging the the history or the legacy or you're removing the evidence that we had of our, our history in the past no these are mythologized histories when you're looking at the way these these you know statues were put up who they were put up by they were put up by the citizens of their day they were reflecting the values of those citizens and of course those citizens had different thinking to the way we do so we wouldn't put up those statues today because we have different understandings and, and outlooks the, the wealth and power that they had and they were displaying when they built those monuments and named those streets of course was glorifying a past that they were proud of hence why virginia street was there why jamaica street was there we're different therefore the discussion we need to have today with citizens about how do we use the stage set that these people have bequeathed us and how do we use it differently if Britain continues to exist, I think it will need to adopt a reparative justice approach to the slavery legacy and learn the lessons of its past, because the racism of yesterday has its impact on the racism of now. So to wrap up, I'm going to say this. The cultural heritage sector must lead the way in reparative justice. It must make it practical, but it also needs to get cities and nations to consider doing the same. And we, as the City Council, passed an important resolution in September, which basically gave us the, it was a response to Black Lives Matter, and it gave us three fundamental things to do. One of them was to look into the, the names, squares, the physical infrastructure of, of heritage, and to engage the Glasgow public in a discussion and a consultation about what we should now do. Should these names be added to with plaques, which explain the slavery legacy of Mr. Andrew Cochrane or you know the other people whose name you know we can and so on the names who we know are from slavery should we have plaques saying that should we change the names and if we were going to change the names who should they be changed to should we be remembering some honorary black Scots for example these are questions that the public needs to ask itself based on its uh, its modern take and I, I want to offer one uh, comfort that if you look at the way we have repurposed the Duke of Wellington statue with the cone, you know, that was originally built to glorify war and imperialism and a warrior and a deeply conservative imperialist, but it's a, got a different cultural context because Glasgow people have refashioned it and remade it. Uh, we are going to have a statue of Nelson Mandela sometime in the near future, which also reflects the way we feel about things. We've had plaques for Frederick Douglass in Edinburgh. We, 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 are beginning to tell our story in a way which is properly inclusive. And I suppose we're going through one of our four phases, which is acknowledgement and awareness raising, public education. So we're, we're going through those sections of the, the several A's, as I call them. Later, we will talk about atonement, apologies, and then making amends and making repair. But right now, it's a time for acknowledgement and awareness raising. Great. Thank you so much, Graham. That was absolutely fascinating. I think what I found most interesting was um, the idea that, that built heritage in particular can, can be sort of used as a, an anti-racism tool and that for once heritage is going to lead the way in a, in a very global current movement um, in a really visible way as well. And I think that's fascinating. And I think it's all the work you've been doing along with Stephen Mullen has been really interesting for us here in Glasgow. And as I said earlier, we're looking at our own reinterpretation at the moment for Tobacco Merchant's House. 